Chuck Swindoll, been in the ministry for many years, pretty well-known speaker and author, tells a story early in his ministry. He served in a town in Massachusetts called Waltham. He said there was another church there in that town that had an interesting history, had gone through a lot, and they had a young man come and become the minister there. And that church had uh, gone through some controversy, and when he got there, he uh, faced some opposition and things. And his first Sunday there, he got up to preach and noticed that everybody was sitting on the last three rows of the church. He didn't let it even phase him. He picked up the pulpit, carried it back to where they were, and sat it down and began preaching. And he did that each Sunday, and what he found as the Sundays progressed, he had to actually move the pulpit back, you know, or back towards the front a little bit. And he just kept doing that, and people started coming, and pretty soon he was sitting in the choir loft preaching. Uh, the place had been filled so much. But then he left that church. He was called to um, take the head position at a Christian education school, Christian school, and went and led that school. And the minister they got in his place was a brilliant man, was a well-known scholar, had traveled around the world and things. And when he came, he also faced some opposition, but he was so elegant and so good at being argumentative and things like that, that he began to deal with all the controversy that he heard, you know, pretty harshly sometimes from the pulpit. And he would, you know, always present in such a way that no one could argue. But what happened was all of a sudden, those rows began to get empty again. And pretty soon it was back to what it was when the other minister came. He won the arguments, but he lost the battle. It's interesting the dynamics that take place in a group setting, thus the church. Today, I want us to think about some of those things. I know a lot of you come from different churches. Some of you are here for the, the winter from up north, and you come from churches. Some of you are here year-round, and you're part of Anchor. Some of you may be visiting today for the first time. I, I don't know. And we come together, and any time we gather together, we are His church. It's not the building. It's not all the, the trimmings. It's his people. So as we continue our journey through Nehemiah chapter 4, we have um, taken a look at Nehemiah kind of from an individual basis. How would you respond to this? But today I want us to respond, and I, I think this is the, the best way to approach this next chapter, chapter 4, kind of from a corporate mindset. What happens in a group of God's people? What happens when conflict arises or discouragement discouragement comes our way? Are there things that we can learn? Are there, there ways that we can prepare ourselves? Are there things that we can do to help God's church be the church that he wants us to be? Well, I think they are. And chapter 4 of Nehemiah, I don't have time. We're not going to read through the whole chapter. So let me summarize it for you very quickly. Nehemiah chapter 4, we find that there is opposition that comes. There is conflict uh, waiting on the horizon. We've mentioned the last two weeks a couple of guys by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah. And I keep saying we're going to get to those guys. Well, today we're going to look at them. This isn't the last time they'll pop up in this book. But they come and they start doing some things to discourage the people, to try to get them to stop building the wall. Nehemiah is aware of this, he hears about it, and he does some things to help counteract what they are trying to do. So that's the story of chapter 4, the opposition and the response Nehemiah comes up with. And from that, I think that we can learn some good things today. If we're going to get beyond conflict and discouragement, we need to look at how Nehemiah led his people through these things that happened in their time and the, the, uh, the task that they had before us. So I'm going to start with chapter 4 of Nehemiah, and I'm not going to read all the passages, all the verses. I kind of summarized it. I would encourage you to go back and read it on your own and kind of fill in some of those blank spots. But here's what happens in the first opening verses of Nehemiah chapter 4. I'm going to read on the screen. It's going to be verses 4 through 6, I'm going to, or 4 and 5. I'm going to read starting with verse 1. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Samaritan army officers, What does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? 
Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked on top of it. Foxes aren't like elephants. They're pretty small animals. Verse 4. Then I prayed, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not plot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. The first thing I think we can learn about how to go beyond discouragement and conflict is what Nehemiah did. It begins on your knees. It begins on your knees. In verse 4, how did Nehemiah react? He reacted by praying. But I prayed. Now we have seen in Nehemiah that this is not the uh, unusual thing for Nehemiah to, to do. Prayer was the first go-to thing. In chapter 1, when he heard that the walls had, broke, had been broken down, what did he do? He mourned, he prayed, and he fasted. In chapter 2, as he was in front of the king, and the king asked him what he needed or what was wrong, what was the first thing he did? He prayed. Lord, please give me the words to say. It was not a last option for Nehemiah. It was his first go-to thing. And anytime he faced some type of conflict, some type of discouragement in his life. We need to make prayer our first go-to rather than our last. I remember one time a man came up to me in the foyer on Sunday morning and said, well, Jeff, why don't you go ahead and put Sue on the prayer list? I've tried everything else. I might as well do that. You know, she'd been ill for a while, and I thought, wow, I'm not quite sure if that's the, uh, the approach. I, I've had someone else say, well, well, why don't you go ahead and put me on that prayer list? I hate to do that, but I don't know what else to do. You know, I'm glad they finally thought of prayer. But prayer shouldn't be our last option. Prayer shouldn't be, well, I've tried everything else, and I haven't been able to take care of it. Now I guess I'll turn to the last resorts. No, for Nehemiah, it was the first thing on, the, on his mind. When Sanballat and Tobiah stood up and started mocking the people, the first thing he did is he went to the Lord. He went to his knees in prayer. Now his prayer is an interesting prayer. It says, hear us, O God, we are being mocked. And he doesn't back down from anything, does he? May their scoffing fall back on their own heads. May they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins. That doesn't sound really like a politically correct prayer. There are other times in the Old Testament, especially in the book of Psalms, where you'll find prayers like that from David when he was facing his enemies. And you might think, well, how in the world can we balance this prayer with the words of Jesus when he said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Here's my take on it. What we see here with Nehemiah and what we see in the Psalms with David, they were so passionate for God that they wanted God to stand up and they wanted to be on God's side because they knew that God was in control. Did you catch that last phrase? For they have provoked, it doesn't say the people, does it? It says, for they have provoked you here in front of the people. Lord, stand up for who you are. And he's calling on the Lord. You know, kind of as a side note, we could learn from that today. We need more people to stand up for God. We need to ask him, Lord, take care of this situation. Because there are those who oppose God. There are those who oppose His church. And too many times we, in a way, back away from that. And Nehemiah just up front said, Lord, you need to take care of this problem. We put our trust in you. You are the one in charge. You are the one in control. They have mocked you. Lord, it is now in your hands. Prayer. 
Many times a battle should begin on our knees. And that's what Nehemiah was gearing the people up for. But before he said a word to them, he went to his father and said, Now, Lord, we need your help. Next time you're faced with conflict or discouragement, be it in your own personal life, be it in the church, what's the first thing that needs to be done? Pray. Pray. Well, the story goes on. After Nehemiah has prayed, he does something also important. He, he goes on and he identifies the cause of the problem. He, he looks at the situation. I think the first thing he, he identifies is a loss of vision. Verse 6. At last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. You know, it's important sometimes to stop and just reflect and try to figure out just what's going on here. I don't know about you, but I know there's been times in my life where I've just kind of been down or, or you know, just something's bothering me. And someone said, well, what's wrong? Well, I just really don't know. And if I can think about it, and identify the cause of the problem, then all of a sudden, oh yeah, that's what it is. And then it's much easier to deal with and to, to move on from that point. In these next several verses, I think we see some of the causes, and it's good to identify some of the causes that can cause discouragement. And in this verse, it's interesting, I, I think there's a loss of vision. How much of the wall had been built? Half of the wall. Now, it's, it's easy to get in on the ground floor of a project as it starts. you got people that are excited, and, and they're all coming together, and we've seen that in Nehemiah, and they're saying, oh, this is great, let's go. Maybe you've done a project at home like that. You've gathered all the materials. You've made your 16 trips to Home Depot. you got everything you need now, and you get going on it, and you get halfway into it, and you think, man, why didn't I hire somebody to do this? <laughs> This is a lot bigger job than I thought. And you look back and it's half done. And like, oh man, what was I thinking? Well, the people were halfway there. The enthusiasm was high. But did you catch the verb tense in that phrase there in the second part of that verse? The people had worked with enthusiasm. I'm no grammar major, but that sounds like past tense. They had worked. They'd worked hard to this point. But now something had come up. Something had gotten in the way. Sambala and Tobiah had come along and started discouraging them, trying to get them off track. They'd lost the vision of why they were doing what they were doing. Down in verse 10, we see what I think is the second cause, and that's they were beginning to lose strength. Verse 10, the first half of the verse says this, then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. You don't know of anyone that's ever complained about anything, do you? Have you? None of you have ever complained, have you? Nah, not us. The people of Judah began to complain. They said, look, the, the workers are getting tired, Nehemiah. And there is so much more rubble. How, how in the world are we going to do this? They were losing strength. They'd lost their vision. And that's when discouragement can sit in. The second thing, they, they lost their confidence in the second half of verse 10. It says, we will never be able to, re, to, to build the wall by ourselves. There was a loss of confidence in themselves. They looked around and who did they see? They saw no one. We're never going to be able to do this by ourselves. Who was there to help them? The people who destroyed the wall sure weren't going to help them. Sanballat and Tobiah and the Sumerian army, they sure weren't going to help them because they were opposed to them. And they began to look around and they began to lose confidence. Why? You know, confidence makes an amazing difference in what you do. I like sports. I've 
use the illustration for sports again, but I got to use another one, all right? Yesterday, I watched the Indiana-Minnesota basketball game. There was a point there where Indiana was behind, and there was a guy that came off the, the bench, Nick Zeisloff. He's a, a, a transfer player, and he's basically a three-point shooter. But last week, against Ohio State, whom Indiana beat, <coughs> by the way, uh, all you Ohio State fans, Zaislav came off the bench and was 0 for 7. And in the games before that, he was 0 for. And it was like he'd forgotten what to do. He came off the bench and in a matter of two minutes, hit four three-pointers, bang, bang, bang in the row. One of the last ones, he was falling out of bound from the corner and it just went in. And he got his confidence back. When a player restores confidence, it's amazing. It's the same ball, the same height to the basket, same shooting skill, but just something about confidence that makes a difference. When we lose confidence, it can be very devastating. It can be very discouraging. And that's what started to happen in the people. One final thing in verse 11. It says, Meanwhile, our enemies were saying, Before they know what's happening, we will swoop down on them and kill them. And end their work. They were not only tired, weary, feeling alone, lost confidence. Now they lost the security that they had when they started. They thought everything was going to be great. They thought everybody was going to be on their side. They thought things were going to just, just roll along without any opposition. And then when it comes, they lose their security. There's some other verses there that said, Excuse me, it wasn't all from the outside. There were Jews that lived outside the wall of Jerusalem. It says that they lived near the enemy. And those Jews, they were coming back to the wall there and talking to the workers, and they were telling them, you guys better watch out because we overheard some of the Samaritan army. They're talking about how they're going to come in and they're going to wipe you out while you're working when you least expect it. So some of the discouragement came from within their own people. Nehemiah was aware of all these things. He had identified the cause. And then he did something that was very important. He got them to focus on the right things. Anytime that you face something in your life, your focus is going to make such a difference. What is it you're focused on? What is it you're focused on when you, you come to church? Are you focused on what the preacher's wearing? What color the carpet is? You know, what the lighting looks like? Whether you like that song or this song? Did someone say hi to you or not say hi to you? Those are all things that we are aware of. But what should our focus be? Well, Nehemiah reminds them not to forget the goal. Why it is you're working. Verse 13 says this. So. That's a neat word. So. Wrapped up in two little letters. This is what we've decided to do. So I placed armed guards behind the lowest parts of the wall in the exposed areas. I stationed the people to stand guard by families armed with swords, spears, and bows. In other words, he organized them around the goal. He reinvigorated them. I'm sure he reminded them, look, why are we doing this? I know there's some problems. I know there's some things out there. But this is what we're going to do. We're going to give some of you weapons. We're going to give you some of you spears and swords. We're going to set up some guards. And, and you can read in verses 14 through the end of the chapter all the things that he did. And he did all of that so they could focus on the one thing they were supposed to be doing, focusing on the goal of building the wall. Focus is so important. If we get out of focus, we can get distracted so easily. Or if we take our focus on something and put it on something else, that can just distract and discourage in so many ways. This past year, Anchor have been going through a strategic planning process in November. Some of you are here, some of you weren't here. We shared with the congregation what our strategic plan, what we hope uh, to see happen in the future 
here at Anchor. Because we believe that it's important to cast vision and that it's important to, to set some goals for us to, to, to center around. Our mission, love God, love our neighbors by being the hands, feet, and heart of Jesus. How are we going to live that out? How are we going to best equip ourselves, get us ready to face the challenges in front of us? You can get a copy of the complete strategic plan if you want it. Let me just summarize some of the major things. Number one, we've committed to this year here at Anchor to add a third full-time staff person. We're going to call that a family life ministry director. Someone that can come in and can work with the children's ministry and can equip teachers and work uh, at equipping the youth ministry and, and do outreach events to the community where we can minister to families and reach families and, and be that church of multiple generations, ministering to multiple generations. And that's going to be a big step of faith. It's going to take funds. It's going to take vision. It's going to take a lot of things for that to come together. But we really believe that's where God wants us to go. To continue to reach out to those that need to be reached. As more and more families are getting further and further away from the Lord. And, and fewer and fewer children are getting to know who Jesus is. And, and what he has done for them. We feel this important imperative that we do that and move forward. A second aspect of the vision or the strategic plan is we need to get some more space. If we were to add another class for uh, Sunday school on Sunday morning. We can't do it right now. We met with a guy yesterday, last Sunday afternoon. And he said, one of the things that you need to do is, is create a young adult Bible school class. He said, the problem is we don't have a room that we could even do that in. So in the strategic plan, the team put together and we're investigating. And I say investigating because we hope to consult with a design build company where we will get input from them, their professional analysis. But what we've outlined is this, let's try possibly a three-phase approach where first we'll build another building that will give us some office space and some classroom space. We can take the offices out of that wing there, make them classrooms so that we can have more classrooms under these, this roof, especially for the younger children. Second phase is that we would possibly build a recreational fellowship center where we can have events, large potluck fellowship events, as well as a recreational facility where you could do more things with, with young people and family. And, and there's all kinds of stuff you can do with that. A third phase would be let's expand then our worship seating. Right now with multiple services, we, can, uh, we had almost 400 in worship last Sunday over the three services. We feel that's going to be adequate for a while, but let's eventually get to the point where we need a better design, larger auditorium where we can continue to grow. That would, because of the footprint of this building and the property limitations we have, it would mean meeting for worship in the Fellowship Recreational Center for a while while we tear this building down and raise up a new building that would better facilitate the needs that we have. That is a lot. It's not going to all happen the next three months. And along the way, there's going to be send ballots and Tobias come along. Say, what in the world do you think you're doing? How are you going to do all this? I was so encouraged when we presented it, though, at the congregational meeting in November. There was not one negative word nor one negative question. There were good questions. What about this? Have you thought about this? What if we tried this? That was so encouraging to me. But as we go into this, let's not lose sight of the goal. Because along the way, because we're all human, there's going to be times where we begin to question our own confidence, our own ability, and all those things. Nehemiah was aware of that. And what do you do? He had helped them focus on one other thing. In verse 14, he said this, Then I said, I looked over the situation. I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers and your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. Focus on God. He calls them together and says, now remember this. Don't be afraid. The enemy is out there. The enemy is not going to go away. But remember who's on your side. 
In fact, remember who it is you're fighting for. Why you're protecting your family, your sons and your daughters and all those people in your homes. It's because you have a great and glorious Lord. And when we keep focused on Him, God will do amazing things. Let's keep focused on God. In the days and the weeks and the years to come. And when that happens, He can do great things. One of my favorite verses in the New Testament that has to do with vision and trusting in the Lord to take us where we're not even sure where we're going to go, how we're going to get there, is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Paul says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. It's a great passage. When the walls are left in rubble, when discouragement comes our way, when we're not sure if we have the strength to go on, when it seems that attacks are coming from out and within, what does God call us to do? He says, look at Him who's able to do more than we even imagined or hoped for according to His power at work within us. Are you willing to let His power work in you to go forward to be His church? It's a question only you can answer. Answer it well. Let's pray.